morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is David Lawrence. I'm the REA for Central Alabama Commercial Horticulture. I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about soil borne pathogens um, and vegetable crops. Um, just kind of a basic overview, not going to dive in a whole lot into certain pathogens or control methods, um, but just kind of a basic overview. Um, happy Halloween. Sorry, I didn't dress up like Eric. Um, maybe next year. Um, some of the topics we're going to talk about, uh, just going to look at some terminology, um, then different pathogen groups, factors influencing infection, uh, diagnostics, and control strategies. All right, so why are we talking about soil borne diseases? Um, they can significantly reduce yields and quality in fruit and vegetable crops. Um, I threw fruit in there because a lot of the fruits that we manage, uh, for instance, strawberries, we treat those basically like we would an annual vegetable. Um, and then even some of our shorter lived um, fruit crops, uh, they can have a significant influence on those. Uh, they often survive for several years in the soil and that, that's what makes them so hard to control. Um, it's not just a quick fix, something we can spray and then, you know, get on a two week rotation like we do for a lot of our other diseases. Um, these can survive for a long time in the soil. And then uh, simultaneous infections can cause a disease complex. Um, what comes to mind for me is in strawberries, black root rot, that's often a complex of whether it's pythium, rhizop, nematodes, um, you know, whatever, there's a disease complex. So that really gets complicated when you're trying to rotate or um, for other controlled methods. I, uh, some of the terminology, um, just basic, you know, pathogens, those are the biological agents that cause the problem. Um, symptoms are the visible reactions of the plant when it becomes infected. So if you're out in your field and you see a plant that's wilting or off color a little bit, um, that's the symptom. Um, the sign is the visible evidence of the presence of the pathogen. And so that's going to be the sclerotia, bacterial ooze, mycelial growth. Uh, the picture that I have there is southern blight on tomatoes. And that's, that's what comes to mind when I think of signs of uh, soil-borne infection. Uh, it's very easy to diagnose in the field. Uh, you see that white. If you look at the base of the tomato plant, first you're going to see it starting to wilt. Um, often you'll see it kind of working its way down the row. And if you go to the base of that plant, you're going to look down, you'll see that white mycelial growth, uh, those orange or brownish uh, sclerotia. And that is a telltale sign of uh, southern blight on tomatoes. Uh, inoculum is a biological agent that is able to affect the host. So whether it's the spores, the mycelium, sclerotium, um, what's you know what's going to stay in that soil and affect future plantings, uh, and then just soil-borne pathogens, the pathogen that causes plant disease um, through contact with the soil. Um, the different pathogen groups are fungi, bacteria, virus, and nematodes. We'll look at these real quick. Uh, fungi is by far the most numerous. Uh, it's the most economically important, um, you know, pound for pound. I don't know how these compare to the other groups, but it is definitely the most economically important just because of the vast number of pathogens in this group. Uh, they, they are the winners as far as persisting in the soil for the longest amount of time. And so some of the notable fungi pathogens include Phytophthora, Pythium, uh, Rhizoctonia, Sclerotia, or Clartinia, uh, Fusarium, and Verticillium. Um, you know, almost all of these are very important on crops such as tomatoes or peppers. Um, so if you, anybody grows any of those, I'm sure you've probably had a run in with some of these before. Um, fungal pathogens live on plant debris or other organic matter in the soil. Um, or they can survive as free living organisms and they can survive in a wide range of environmental conditions. Uh, the picture on my left uh, is with the little tomato seedling is uh, damping off. And so if you see this, um, a lot of times you'll see this in a greenhouse or planting early in the year, um, you'll see that right above the soil line, it looks like the stem is pinched. Um, that is a sign of damping off. Um, whether it's pythium or rhizoc, I think this one was pythium. And the picture on the right is a uh, okra seedling. I think it was uh, a week or two from sprouting, after sprouting, and um, 
the whole road looked like this, pulled this seedling up, and I believe this one came back as Rhizoc. Um, we just had some, had a wet planting. Bacteria are not nearly as numerous as fungi. Um, most of them do not persist for long periods of time. Um, so there's some of the common ones, common ones, Armenia, Rhizonomus, and Streptomyces. Uh, Streptomyces is fairly common on potato, and so this is a sweet potato soil rot. Um, Streptomyces also causes potato scab. Um, viruses are extremely rare. I, I don't know if I've ever seen a, in person a soil borne virus. Um, latest big main virus is you know, maybe one that you might have heard of. Um, it can also, you know, it has to have living, like most viruses, has to have a vector. So it has to have living tissue to survive or can survive in nematodes or fungal vectors. Uh, and then lastly, nematodes. Um, most everyone knows what nematodes are. They're non-segmented uh, microscopic roundworms, um, plant parasitic nematodes spend their lives feeding on plant roots, on or in plant roots. Um, fields infected with plant parasitic nematodes uh, will have reduced yields and reduced quality. Um, this picture that I took here was a couple of years ago. It was in a really large tomato operation, and he had a section of his field that uh, the plants looked okay, but when he got through harvesting at the end of the year, he noticed his yields are way down. Um, and so after looking around a little bit, collected some samples and pulled these up, and sure enough, uh, most of the plants' roots look like this. And, um, you know, it's not really something that if he hadn't had other numbers to compare it with, you might have just thought he had a down year, but um, you know, probably a 10, 15, 20% re reduction in yield um, because of these root knot nematodes. All right, so factors influencing infection, um, the soil type, um, and with that comes moisture, whether it's a you know, sandy loam or a heavy clay soil. Um, typically, the wetter the soil is, the, uh, you know, the higher the water holding capacity is, uh, the bigger instance of soil borne pathogens you're going to have. Uh, what nutrients are available? Um, what nitrogen source you're using? Depending on what nitrogen source, some, some pathogens um, thrive off of those sources that you're using. And soil pH. Um, some pathogens are you know, basically non existent. Uh, whether you're below a certain pH or a higher pH, um, it's not a, it's not, um, not a set scale for every pathogen out there. It just depends on what pathogen you're dealing with. Um, soil temperature. A lot of our vegetable growers are using plastic mulch, and so you know you can plant a little bit earlier in the year. And so if you're dealing with like some of those damping off, like pythium, um, you know those cooler wetter temperatures are going to be more conducive for development of that pathogen. Um, white plastic versus black plastic. Um, you know, we don't use a lot of black plastic in the middle of the summer because it just gets too hot and you're going to put more stress on those plants and develop an environment that's going to uh, stimulate that pathogen development. Uh, and then planting date, you know, just kind of goes with soil temperature. You know, of course, later we'll wait in the year, um, we'll kind of get out of that cool spelled but also we get more into if we wait too late we get into um, too hot of soil temperatures uh, cultivation practices um, sanitation you know are you keeping your field clean uh, are you getting that old plant debris out of there and then what was your previous crop um, you no know, crop rotation we'll talk about it in a minute but crop rotation is very important when you're dealing with soil pathogens um, diagnostics it's pretty hard to diagnose diagnose these in the field um, unless, like I said, southern blight or something or dampening off something that's really got those key characteristics. Otherwise, uh, we really rely on our plant diagnostics lab. Um, but when you're looking for uh, trying to diagnose these soil borne pathogens, you need to observe the whole field. Um, this picture I have on the bottom left is, you know, it's actually a strawberry field, but like I said, we treat strawberries basically like an annual vegetable here. Um, if you'll notice the third row from the bottom, those plants are, you know, a quarter of the size of the other rows. And so I noticed, you know, this is a huge field, um, doesn't represent this picture, but this this little area of the field 
was really stunning. And so we took samples and I don't know if it was holding water or didn't get treated the same. This actually a fumigated field. So I suspect this road might have gotten skipped uh, during fumigation, but uh, it came back as Rhizoc. Um, uh, so when you want to collect samples, you want to collect the entire plant, um, including the roots, and you want to collect plants that have you know healthy tissue and infected tissue. Uh, you also want to keep records uh, of disease for confirmation when you're planning next year. It's you know it's easy to remember for a week or so, but come this time next year when you're getting ready to plant, it's easy to forget what areas were affected. So try to keep good records. Um, control strategies. Um, host resistance is a big one, and so if you know. Uh, on the right there, I have just some uh, tomato disease codes. And so if you know that you have uh, fusarium wilt and you don't have the option to rotate, let's say you're, you know, you've got a small acreage or you're planting in a high tunnel or something, um, you want to go through there and, and first thing I'm going to do is select varieties that have fusarium wilt resistance. Um, that's that's the easiest way to overcome that. Um, rotation, as I mentioned, is huge. Um, a lot of these Fungal pathogens especially can live for a long time in the soil. So uh, the more we can rotate and keep uh, hosts out of that area that are uh, vulnerable to these pathogens, the better off we're going to be. Irrigation practices, uh, we want to maintain optimal soil moisture. And a lot of that is going to be utilized through drip irrigation. Dr drip is a way to keep soil moisture where it needs to be, um, where it needs to be. Uh, and also plant well-drained areas. You know, we, we want to try to avoid low-lying areas that are going to hold moisture. Um, try to plant areas that are they're going to drain for us when we have um, heavy rain events um, or increased irrigation. Um, again, sanitation or removing plant debris. Um, clean your equipment if you're rotating from field to field, um, plowing or laying plastic. Um, try to clean your equipment if you've got an area that you know has some of these pathogens. Um, you know, wash it off, clean it off before you move to the next area. Planning practices, um, you know, timing. Again, we talked about that with soil temperature. Um, the depth, you know, how long is that seed going to take to emerge? Um, using seeds versus transplants. Um, again, like damping off, that's, that's one of the advantages of using transplants as you kind of give that seedling a head start. Uh, use disease free seed or transplants. Um, and then also um, utilizing cover crop. For example, mustard um, has some uh, pathogen reducing properties. Uh, when you grow that crop out, till it in um, into your soil, it can help, help reduce some of those pathogens. And soil solarization, uh, which is ideal for small areas or raised beds. So uh, we have a video on that um, on our, our ACES website. Um, all right, and then chemical control. Uh, fumigation is, uh, I say, mostly effective. It's not a cure-all. It's not a guarantee. Um, it is very expensive. It requires specialized equipment and additional license. So there are a few growers that still do it. Uh, most everyone that I know that does it gets it hired out, gets it contracted out through an independent contractor. Um, but it is an option. Um, conventional control or conventional chemicals. Um, they can be effective. Uh, the application is critical, getting that product um, to where it needs to be, doing it at the exact right time, um, and then, of course, choosing the right product um, for the job. Um, if you're looking into chemicals and uh, if you're not familiar with this, this is uh, just a page out of our Southeastern U.S. Vegetable Crop Handbook. Um, you can look that up. There's a PDF of it online uh, if you don't have one in, uh, don't have a hard copy. And so you would just go to whatever crop you're growing. This was a page from tomatoes. I just picked Southern Blight. And so you can see there the products that they list, um, the group number. It's, it's important always to rotate group numbers uh, if you're doing, you know, season long control. Um, and then it tells you there. You know, I mean, as you can see, most of these says disease suppression only. So these aren't, you know, aren't cure-alls for these pathogens, but they will help. Um, and uh, that's it. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me or any other agents in your area. Um, we'll be happy to help you.
you have any questions, please let me know.